Paul McCarty is a DevSecOps evangelist and the founder of SecureStack, which helps software engineers and security teams collaborate better while building more secure applications. Paul is the author of several open source projects and is a collaborator on a number of others and helps run three meetups where he lives in Australia. Paul tried to be a professional snowboarder in the 2000s, but is now a skater dad who's passing his love of hacking software onto his kids. Paul joins us to discuss visualizing the software supply chain and the DevSecOps playbook. He shares insights on securing the supply chain, walks us through these projects, and provides guidance on actionable steps you can take to secure your software supply chain. We hope you enjoy this conversation with Paul McCarty. Are you struggling to measure the effectiveness of your secure code training? You're not alone. That's why we're proud to share that on average, security journey learners increase their knowledge an average of 33 and as much as 85%. Our diverse training content satisfies a variety of adult learning styles, from conversational training videos to hands-on secure coding activities, ensuring that learners are engaged no matter their learning style. Visit securityjourney.com to try our training today. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Application Security Podcast. I'm Robert Hurlbut. I'm a Principal Application Security Architect and Threat Modeling Lead at Acquia, and I'm joined by my friend, Chris Romeo. Hey, Chris. Hey, Robert. Chris Romeo, CEO of Curve Ventures, and uh, super excited to have a fellow Michigander. Look that one up mm -hmm. if you don't know who it is. A fellow Michigander joining us today. Yeah, we have uh, Paul McCarty uh, joining us. Uh, welcome, Paul. Hey, thanks, guys, for having me, and, uh, and shout out to Detroit, for sure. Definitely. So what we like to typically do when we're starting out our podcast is we ask our guests to uh, give us your security origin so story. So let us know what, what, uh, what brought you here uh, for security. Yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting journey. And by the way, thanks guys for, for having me. I'm a long time listener, first time caller. Um, the, the reality is that my journey was kind of unusual in the sense that I, I started out as a Unix admin, as many people did in the 90s. Um, I went to Wayne State University in Detroit and um, got a job in the computer lab there and somehow found myself working for an ISP, an early ISP. And um, one of the things that I had to do there is I actually had to help them secure the network. And that was kind of my, my early days. But a few years later, I was working for a large uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield affi affiliate out West. And um, they, they came to the, the, the security team, sorry, the Unix team, which I was on at the time. And they said, hey, can somebody help us write a hardening document for, for all of our Unix systems? And nobody on my team, everybody's like, oh, I don't want that. I don't want anything to do with that. And then... Um, uh, I'd always had an interest in and had been writing some stuff in, in IP um, firewall for, for some of the early Linux stuff. And I, I put my hand up and that was really where it kind of kicked off. Very cool. So how, I mean, I'm curious now how, I mean, that's, you kind of stopped the story kind of midstream as a Unix admin creating a, uh, creating a hardening guide, which I remember those documents as things guaranteed to stop the computer from working on next reboot. hundred percent. So we were referred to that. So how, I mean, how did you get to the to AppSec? Like what you, was there a transitionary point from InfoSec to AppSec or what's that look like? Yeah. I mean, I think that my specialty through the, the 2000s was really kind of building application uh, environments at scale. So I did that for a bunch of startups and, and large organizations, John Deere and JPL, NASA J JPL and, and uh, Linux networks and some others. And basically that kind of building the application environment evolved over time to, to working more and more closely with the dev teams. And then by the time that I went back to Blue Cross Blue Shield in the, uh, I don't know, it would have been 2010, 2011, I joined the platform, the, the early platform team, and that's when I really started spending most of my time doing what was was then not called DevOps, but that's what we were doing. We were doing DevOps. We were kind of a combined um, team of QA um, engineers, software engineers, and um, system admins working together, and that was really where my my AppSec chops started. Yeah, and I know we want to talk about software supply chain, and 
It feels like everybody on earth should already know what software supply chain is, but I want to get your definition as somebody who's been diving in the deep end of the software supply chain pool. What do you, what's the official definition that you use? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because that, that was the problem that I, I faced is that we had all these people talking about attacks on the software supply chain and, and having issues around the software supply chain. And when you ask people, you'd get different answers, right? Um, and there was a lot of kind of focus on open source libraries, but the reality is that um, applications are built from a lot more than just the open source libraries. And so I, I really dove in to your point and, and started thinking and talking to people about, you know, what were the things in the application that needed to be there? Because ultimately that's what a supply chain is. It's all the stuff that you have to pick to put together to make an application work. So if you use my famous burrito metaphor, right? If you want to make a burrito, you need a tortilla, you need some refried beans, cheese, and sauce, and some other things, right? And really understanding the complexity of the application um, you know, environment and the supply chain that goes into it, it includes things like, hey, the software engineers. Without them, you can't build software, right? The, the kind of custom local environments the software engineers use, the customizations to their IDEs and their local environments, the CI and the CD and the runtime and any specific hardware. So as I thought about this, I started coalescing it together and that's how I started writing my, my document. Have you thought about how software supply chain differs from other types of supply chains? So like I remember when I first got introduced to supply chain, it was while working at Cisco. And so in those days, yep. we're talking... I don't know, mid 2000s, 2005, 2006 in that time frame. And supply chain from a Cisco perspective means something pretty different because for in those days, the supply chain was the, what do they call it? It was the bill of materials, right? So it was the bomb. It wasn't an S-bomb or an ML bomb or anything. It was just a bomb. It was a bill of materials. These are all the components that go into building a metal box and making it route packets, for example. So any any thoughts about kind of comparisons between the software supply chain and other supply chains that exist? No, that's a great point. I mean, because we, we we love to use that metaphor, right? We love, we love to talk about burritos or, you know, the way the cars are made on an assembly line, right? But the reality is that when you build that box you were just talking about, you build it and you put it in another box and you ship it off and it's done. It's a one-time thing, Right. Whereas the software, the software that we're building now is being, it's highly iterative. Like some, some of my customers are building 80 times a day. If you were to build a bomb or, or, or a snapshot of, snap of the software supply chain, you'd have to do it 80 times a day because the application, guess what, is changing 80 times a day. And so that's the main difference, mate, is that just how much it changes. And it changes between dev, staging, and prod too. And, and that's, that's another focus that, we have to think about because as people start to, you know, want to secure the software supply chain, they typically don't use the same security controls in dev and staging. And, and you guys were talking about this in our earlier podcast. They don't use the same controls in dev and staging that they do in prod. And that's a problem. No, definitely. Uh, so just to jump in, uh, there's a, a term you've used application composition awareness. And that's an interesting one. Uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah, this is this is me kind of um, um, trying to be creative. <laughs> so this is, I mean, so we're talking a lot about software supply chain nowadays, and the government's talking about it. And you know, we there's a lot of emphasis on S bomb software bill of materials, um, as Chris brought up earlier. Um, and there's also a lot of talk about software composition and, and the tools that we use to, to identify the components. Right? Mm. I believe that from a customer's business perspective, they don't care about any of those things. What they care about is, is that burrito safe for me? If I'm allergic to certain food items, is that, do I know if that burrito is going to make me sick? And ultimately, is it safe to sell that burrito, right? So using my metaphor. So I, I think application composition awareness is really about helping to deliver out of these things like S bombs and software supply chain, the, what the customer really needs, which is understanding what's in it. Is it safe for me? And can I sell? So you mentioned something that uh, has been a bit of a dirty word for me. 
over the last uh, oh. number of months, the S bomb. So I think I'm the only known pundit in the world of application security when it comes to S bombs. And I keep trumpeting this everywhere I go, but everybody's so S bomb crazy. It's like the Beatles are coming to America and everybody's running around screaming because of the S bomb. They have S bombs on their t-shirts or something, but like, I'm curious to get your take on, on S bomb. Now I'll just stop there. I'm curious to get your, your take. I'll tell you mine after, but which, what is your take on S bomb? Yeah, no, no leading the question, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Leading the witness. Exactly. Your no, Honor. Leading the witness. No leading the witness. I feel like we're back in Detroit. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, the reality is that I, I'm a proponent of S bomb. I'm a big fan. Right. Um, but however, um, and maybe this is kind of where you're coming from. I don't believe that the S bombs that most people are building or are obsessed with are really delivering the value, the business value that they need. Um, so to me, an S bomb that only includes a subset of your open source libraries that you build only occasionally has almost zero value. Um, S bombs to me have to have several things. The first is they have to be timely. They have to be up to date, up to date. They have to have, they have to be contextually correct. They have to be also comprehensive because if you're only talking about, if we're trying to deliver an S bomb for a burrito or for a car, right? Let's not build an S bomb for a wheel. Let's build an S bomb for a car. And that means that there's a lot more that goes into that application in the application environment than just the open source libraries. And that's in, in, in this, this hype cycle that we're in right now about S bombs. There's a lot of people trying to, you know, meet compliance requirements, but really ultimately what is the business value for an S bomb? And that's what I, that's what I like. And that's mm -hmm. what I want to deliver to my customers too. Yeah, I mean, you hit on a couple of things that have been my challenges here with this. One, we're in, I like the fact you used the word hype cycle. Like there's definitely an SBOM hype cycle. Um, Cyclone DX, the, the OWASP project has come out with ML bombs and SAS bombs and all of these other things. And, and I believe in transparency. I, I, I think that's a good thing, having transparency into what's being built. The challenge I have is SBOM and bombs in general, only 10% of the solution. It's it's if, if you don't take any action, we're spending all this time generating all of these piles of digital artifacts that describe the things that we think we're buying. That's 10 percent of the challenge. Ninety percent is actually improving them, taking that actionable intelligence and doing something with it so that we have a better overall solution. And I just think we're stuck in this government mandate go thinking that this is somehow the solution to some gigantic problem. It's a, it's a solution to transparency, but you even mentioned if you're pushing software 80 times a day, nobody's keeping up with an S bomb for that. They're not taking any action as a result of it. They may be demanding that you provide me an S bomb. They're not going to do anything with 80 of those a day. They'd have to have a system that could ingest them in real time and then provide some actionable value and get some change and then monitor the changes amongst the S bombs. Like we're just not, there's none of that being talked about. And so I just think, I just think we're, we're, we're blowing a lot of smoke trying to, trying to be transparent with what we're building when we should have, we should have taken it a step further and said, let's figure out how to, how to make things better with these things. I I hundred percent agree. I hundred percent agree. The the importance, like, you know, for that highly iterative company that's doing eighty deployments a day, right? The diff, to your point, the diff between the last, you know, S bomb and the current S bomb is important because has there been any change, right? And a lot of this kind of finesse and the nuance around S bomb is being missed, right? So I totally agree, mate. All right, we'll leave that. We'll put that back on the shelf to uh, for my, one of my hot button issues to just continue to bang the drum. But uh, um, I've been banging the drum since RSA and saying the same thing, and no one's even really taken any notice yet. That's okay. I'm going to keep banging the drum because this is what I what I believe. But Robert, uh, what are we? Where are we going next? We're going to look at a project uh, that you've created, uh, Paul. Um, just wanted to first of all, uh, you know, tell us the project and uh, the purpose. You know, why did, why did you create the project? 
Yeah, the um, I, I recently created something called, called the Visualizing the Software Supply Chain Project. It's just a document hosted in the GitHub repository. Um, and the idea really was to to kick off a discussion about you know what is in the software supply chain, what is its scope, what is its breadth, um, and and because we can't really hope to understand or secure the software supply chain, or really to have a conversation of any value if we can't agree <laughs> on what's in it, right? So if you don't know what's in the burrito, you don't know if you want to eat it. So You're making the, me super hungry the, for a burrito, the, by the way. Like this burrito keeps coming back up, I, and I'm I like, know, is there going to be a burrito service? Is there a, a tray of burritos coming know, my way is, here? Sorry. This Sorry. is, uh, you know, parentheses of food podcast all of a sudden, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good metaphor, and I keep I keep beating that dead horse. But anyhow, um, the the reality is that the project was really ultimately to to start that conversation, like what is in it, right? Um, because I think that if we start talking about um, security controls and methodologies that we can use to to protect our software and application environments, but we're not really looking at the whole thing, then we're going to miss stuff. And that was really at its simplest. That's what it is. Paul, let's take a look at the Visualizing Software Security project and ultimately this picture that you've created, because I'd love for you to just walk us through it and explain what are the different components of, of this project. Yeah, thanks, Ben. The, the, it's just, like I said earlier, it's just a, it's just a GitHub repo, um, and it's pretty straightforward right now. It's just a single document, markdown document. Um, but the if we click on the image here, we get a nice bigger version of it. Um, it was really about, you know, describing the software supply chain from end to end. Um, and so I talked to a lot of um, our customers and a lot of friends and, and, you know, took a look at the applications that we were building and kind of broke it down into these uh, 10 sections right here. So it starts at the far left with the, the people that are required to build software. So these are the developers and the QA team and perhaps a DevOps team. And then there's ne the next stage is the local environment. So these are, these are things that customizations or dependencies that are needed uh, inside of the local development environment. You can think of this maybe like an IDE and customizations that developers have um, that help them uh, deliver the software. The next step S is this. SCV. Or is this say source? Sorry? Yeah, sorry. SCV, source code. What's the V? Versioning? Versioning. Versioning. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. Um, and I also, I'm glad you called that out because below that is, is also local tests. You know, I'm a big fan of running local tests, whether those are pre-commit hooks or what have you. Um, and I think those, those are important as, you know, to, to call out as well. So, um, and these are just some of the, the, you know, these are just examples in the gray section here. These are just some of the examples that I came up with. Um, Every software supply chain is going to be its own unique burrito, and so it's going to have its own unique kind of um, components. But yeah, the next stage is the actual store, source code itself, um, and this is the the languages and the frameworks, the libraries um, that we're using to to build software. Uh, and this inclo includes both open source components, but also proprietary code. And I, and I think it's important to call that out because there's so much so much emphasis right now in like open source and, and, and almost the open source is, is the bad guy, right? When, when you look at software composition analysis tools, they typically will only help you with open source components. Open source isn't bad. It's amazing, right? It's the, the whole internet is, is you know, underpinned by great open source projects. So we need to also be thinking about the proprietary code that, that is in our applications as well. Um, so next, the next stage was our integration stage. And this is basically where the, the development team is, is integrating uh, code together uh, as part of a typically a Git repo. Um, it's also the SCM providers like GitHub and GitLab and, and Bitbucket and so forth. The pull requests and any other kind of collaboration components that the team is using. Uh, next stage is deployment. Um, this includes the, the areas of the software supply chain where you're using to actually um, to, to build uh, and, and create a deployable artifact. Um, the next stage is the runtime. This is how it's running. The operating systems, the containers, the servers, so, so on and so forth that, that are needed for the application to run. The next stage is hardware. And this one's an interesting one because 
a lot of times nowadays in this kind of cloud enabled world, we, we don't really think about is there hardware necessary, but there's a lot of applications that require things like, you know, GPUs or, um, or specific, um, you know, PCBs or, or, you know, customized microprocessors or, or things like that. So I wanted to call that out. If that hardware is necessary for that particular software supply chain, if it's a dependency of that software supply chain, it should be called out. Um, the next step is actually the, the DNS or, or the, the namespace that an application uses. And, and this is important because if you're delivering an application to customers and they interact with it, you need that. <laughs> that's part of that dependency structure, right? If that URL doesn't exi- exist, your customers can't get to it, and, and that needs to be called out as well. Um, and then the last two stages are services, uh, which are the kind of third-party components that your application or your application environment uses. This is stuff like third-party APIs, any SaaS solutions, payment gateways, um, identity providers, things like OAuth, what have you. And the last stage is, is cloud. When you say um, serve, when you say SaaS solutions, there can you give me an example? Like what what type of SaaS solution would be part of my software supply chain? Yeah, great great question. Uh, Stripe is a really really good example, right? Mm. Stripe is Stripe is both a my you know our, our platform uses Stripe, so our customers can pay us. Um, that includes you know both kind of software components, but it also includes the SaaS itself. If you don't have um, products and subscriptions set up in, in Stripe, guess what? You're not going to be able to sell your product. And that's just one example of the kind of interdependencies that, that many cloud enabled kind of modern, especially modern web apps have, you know, they're kind of talking to a number of different things. Um, in some cases, even pulling components from, from CDNs, for example. So, Mm-hmm. That's something that I call it there in the last stage, which is cloud. So any cloud services or any kind of components you consume from a cloud service, that's part of your, your software supply chain too as well. And one of the things I found interesting, Paul, about this project was really clicking to going a level deeper into what you've done. Um, because Robert and I, as our audience knows, we're both uh, threat modeling proponents, big fans of threat modeling. And so as I started to kind of scroll down and look at, and and click through some of these, you know, for example, I was just looking at source code a second ago. I click through and you've got this section that says what's in scope, examples of languages, but then what are the security concerns? And so for me, that's kind of what are the threats is what I'm seeing there. You know, if you keep scrolling down, what are the security concerns? Like, so for me, that's one of the interesting things is just to to get a, a perspective on how have you, you know, the depth of, of threat thinking that you've done here as far as helping people understand what are the different threats that are then associated with each of those uh, categories that you put together. So give us some context. For example, let's, let's talk about this, this um, software specific, um, right? Source code, sorry, source code specific when we're looking at. Let's talk about these security concerns. Yeah, sure. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good question. So yeah, that's the you know as I was going over the image, the the, the we've built a matrix um, in the markdown that allows you to click into each one of those stages. Um, and in this case, we're looking at the source code. Uh, I clicked on the source code um, component here in the matrix, and if you scroll down, um, it talks about what's in scope, as you said, programming languages and frameworks that have you, and gives you some kind of visual examples of, of some things that would fall into this category. But then also it talks about who owns it because one of the concerns is that if you're identifying and visualizing the software supply chain and you need to, you know, uh, collaborate with someone so that you can, you can secure that component, who owns it? Who do you talk to? Right. Um, then the, the below that are the, uh, the security concerns, um, which is where we're kind of talking about um, the specific issues around that particular stage of the software supply chain. So in this case, we're looking at the, source code stage of the of the project and i'm talking about here some of the things that that are security concerns in my mind things like knowing what's what's in your soft uh, software is is the primary concern right uh, some other things that i touch on are are the, the dependency origin for the source code um, that's that's super critical so understanding where it's coming from um, and and being aware of that in the team and not just consuming things blindly. 
Um, and, and something like, you know, package managers, we're seeing a lot of attacks right now on package managers and we need to call that out specifically as a target. And then underneath that, I talk about how, what are some of the ways that you can actually secure this? And this particular part of the visualizing software supply chain project, um, this is where I want to spend a lot of time in the future is kind of fleshing out the, how do I secure it part of each one of these stages of all 10 stages. Um, so yeah, more, more to come for this section right here. Now, is this a project that other people could submit PRs against? Yeah, I was wondering. Hundred percent. Cool. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I would absolutely love that. That's the reason that I put this stuff out there because right now, this is just you know my take on it. Um, not only do I want to encourage, and that's that's one of my asks, right? Is is if people are interested in getting involved, please, um, you know, fork it, create a PR, and and get involved. But beyond that, something else that I think is important is that, you know, the way that individual organizations define their software supply chain or want to secure it, that's, that can be individual to them. So if they want to fork this and make their own version of this, hey, you know, have at it. You know, my, my version of the software supply chain is not necessarily going to be the same as yours. And so if that's the case, feel free to fork it and, and make your own changes. Yeah, I could see how some organizations would say, I don't have these, I don't have some of the things that you listed here. And so they could scale it down and, and have, create an artifact that's specific to their environment, has their own picture, has the things that they're really concerned about embedded within. So, yeah, I see a, I see a lot of value in people being able to adapt this and uh, use it just because it does take a complicated concept software supply chain seems like it should be so simple but software supply chain and lays out a framework a, a way to visualize and see what it is and so that's why when i looked at this initially saw it i was like yeah this is a good it's a good teaching thing that everybody like developers should understand because they may encounter threats and different components here that we as security people haven't even thought about yet yeah, man, I, I, that's that's a great point you make about you know being able to take the, the the components from the from my document here and being able to embed these into your own you know company's uh, confluence pages or, or other you know doc, internal documentation. That's that's you know that, that's part of the the value of this for sure. So I think we had um, mention of the DevSecOps playbook, and so. How does that fit in here, the DevSecOps playbook with visualizing software supply chain? The, the DevSecOps playbook is, is a document that I started writing in, in 2022. And um, basically, what it, the, the idea here was that I wanted to create a, a step-by-step guide for my team that I was building um, in that role to, to give them a list of things that we could do um, you know, to, to make our application environments more secure. So DevSecOps is, is a journey. Um, and what I've done here is I've created in the playbook um, 60 plus um, uh, different kind of tasks. I, I don't call them controls. I call them tasks. Um, and, and they're broken down into several different um, uh, domains, which loosely speaking kind of align with uh, the visualizing software supply chain. So I, I rely heavily on this. And in the future, I'd love to do um, a love to do kind of a, um, a collaboration or, or uh, where I'm calling out sections in the DevSecOps playbook from the visualizing software supply chain project. Um, because ultimately, as you identify security issues in your software supply chain, you can come here to the DevSecOps playbook and you can identify, oh, hey, if I start using pre-commit hooks or commit signing, or this addresses some of of those issues in my software supply chain. So there's, there's definitely a relationship between the two um, uh, documents and, and I'm going to flesh that out more over time here. Yeah. I think it's, it's neat that you made the connection to DSOM, the DevSecOps maturity model, uh, Timo Pagel's project within OWASP um, that I, that I look towards and I point people towards that often as just being able to have that maturity model kind of framework to help people roadmap and see. So I see how this, you know, lines up with DSOM and as well as you've mapped it to a lot of other frameworks as well to make it uh, to make it easy to see how it integrates. Um, but yeah, anything that anything that connects with the DSOM, I think together allow you to create a a solid DevSecOps strategy. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the and and by the way, I want just I want to make a shout out that the the DSOM mapping actually was um, was one of the collaborators on the the DevSecOps playbook. Uh, Max, um, he did the DSOM work, and so I, I got to shout that out. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's important for for us to use documents and projects like this to kind of reference um, other areas where we can, you know, we can pull and, and learn from. And, and so I'm a big fan of things like the MBSP, the Minimal Viable Secure Project, and and the um, Oscar framework for kind of identifying threats. And if over time I can start to pull some of those relationships into these projects as well, I think that, you know, that, that helps the community. Yeah. So just to think about security some more uh, for developers and thinking about security uh, with increasing threats to the software supply chain, what advice would you give to developers or organizations to help them uh, secure their software uh, supply chain? Yeah, I think the first thing, and, and I know we've all heard this before, visibility is key, right? <laughs> we've all heard from from a ton of vendors that visibility is important, but the the reality is for the software supply chain, um, I think understanding what's in it and understanding what your software supply chain is comprised from is, is the first step. It's absolutely the first step because this goes back to what I said earlier, which is that you know you, you don't know how to secure something if you don't know what's in it. So, mm -hmm. um, my suggestion to development teams is. Um, to take a look at the, the visualizing software supply chain project that I created and use that to then kind of take a lens to your applications that you're building um, and, and start to understand what's and think about what are the different components that I'm using, that we're using, that, that our application consumes. Because then once you understand that, you can map it out and then you can start to look at, you know, are each one of these stages secure? So without that initial visibility, um, it's tough to do any of the other stuff. That makes sense. So Paul, yeah, from a uh, kind of a key takeaway call to action, I know you mentioned, we, we already talked about people being able to submit PRs against these projects as one potential call to action. So I'll take that one off the board, you know, as I'm known for doing. Uh, what other, like what other key takeaways or call to actions would you, uh, would you leave our, our audience with? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that you know, securing a, and understanding the software supply chain is a complex tax, task, right? So, and I'm, and I'm not saying that, that this is easy. Um, so, I think there are um, some tools out there that, that companies can, can um, leverage um, to help, you know, their teams learn about the software supply chain and, and what, is, what, what is its scope and how do you secure each one of those components. So, I would say that my 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 CTA is to, to organizations to say, hey, um, make it a priority to understand what's going in your burrito and whether it's it's good for your company. Um, and if there are tools out there um, that can help you um, bring that visibility and help you understand the, the, the scope of it and, and, and leverage as much automation as possible, um, that's all good. So that, that would be my that would be my shout out. Very cool. So, Paul, thanks for uh, walking us through these projects, educating us about them. It was good to to get this perspective. I've certainly reviewed them before, but having you walk us through and explain each step was was very helpful. And I think it's going to be helpful for our audience as well. So thanks for the work you've done on these projects. And I look forward to watching them as they mature into the future. Thanks, Az. I really appreciate it. Cheers.